So, you know, we do hear a lot of kind of blind optimism where, you, you, you know, you're like, ah, it's all going to work out. And this is different. It's actually the sense that when I put effort in, I know my effort is going to pay off. I know that, you know, when I'm working hard, something good is going to come out of it. And it's almost like reframing. How do you see that situation? Here's the thing. Life is short and things rarely go according to plan. You owe it to yourself to do more than just survive. You deserve to thrive. So start now. Take the chances, be yourself, pursue happiness, and live your best life. I'm your host, Taylor Stern, and welcome to the Thriving Podcast. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Now, what I saw on the internet was that Albert Einstein said this quote, but we all know. Who knows who really said it? But the truth is there. If you tell a fish that it can climb a tree, and we know it can't, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. And why is why do we do this? I see this so often in society and our culture that this is the case. We just persist a myth about something so natural to who we are, and then we look down on ourselves for it. I see this a lot, particularly with gender norms. You know, boys will be boys. Big girls don't cry. The list goes on. But let's bust these myths and get to thriving. And today, you'll hear from Dr. Tracy Alloway an award-winning psychologist, professor, and TEDx speaker. She's an author of, you know, just 15 books and published over 100 scientific articles about her research of the brain and working memory. But in this conversation, we dive into her latest book, Think Like a Girl, 10 Unique Strengths of a Woman's Brain and How to Make Them Work for You. This grabbed my attention immediately because as a woman in sports, I get asked about being a woman in sports more than any other career question. And why is it such a big point of interest? What's the difference between male and female brains? We've always known that it's not one size fits all. So today, we're going to dispel the myths and stop underestimating our abilities. What I really love about our conversation is that Dr. Tracy Alloway shares how we can make better decisions under stress, lean into our authenticity to be better leaders, and how practicing optimism can actually impact our thriving. And as I was reflecting on this conversation, I did keep thinking about my experience working in sports as a female. And to be honest, I feel like I have actually been able to turn an assumed disadvantage into a strength. And here's how. I did three things. I faced it, I rewrote it, and I connected with it. First of all, facing it. Yes, I know that I am a female, a woman. I've never played football, but when I started working for the Dallas Cowboys, that felt more apparent than ever. You know, it felt like, okay, this is what females do when they work in sports. They're the ones who ask the personal, emotional questions. And, you know, I faced it. Yes, I've never played football, but that doesn't make me any less knowledgeable, any less able to have conversations with these guys, you know, all of that. And so as I was facing it, I realized what are my strengths to being a woman in sports? I have a really good way about me in relating to other people. I was curious about these guys off the field. I didn't have as much interest in the fact that they were running this route compared to this and X, Y, and Z. I didn't, and I knew that, and I wasn't going to fight that. I wasn't going to try to be something I wasn't. I don't particularly find a lot of interest in the X's and O's. I enjoy the games, but I really enjoyed who these people were, both the team and the coaches. And so I used that to my strength, rewriting that. I connected with these men in the locker room, these coaches, in a different way than ever before. I really tried to form unique relationships with them that wasn't just fluff pieces. It was honestly, you know, genuine connection. And so rewriting that, it became my strength that I was able to, you know, bond with them and build trust with them and all that. And so 
connecting with it also made a huge difference. You know, when they saw me, they knew that I wasn't going to come up to them and be like, wow, why did you drop that pass? Or, you know, what's going on with this injury? They probably knew I was going to ask them about their new baby or how their wife or girlfriend was doing. And it just kind of, you know, tore down those walls. So whatever it is in your life that you've believed for so long, you know, that it's, oh, I'm an emotional person or anything that you see is a part of who you are that makes you feel some type of way. It makes you feel lesser than. I promise you, you have the ability to rewrite it, to look at it in a different perspective, to see how it could be a strength instead of a disadvantage or a weakness. And what I ask you is that you listen to today's conversation and you hear that, you know, all of our brains are unique. The way that we are individually wired is special and different. And those differences should be celebrated and utilized and not seen as something that is holding you back and not something that's going to hold you from you know, being your best version of yourself. So thriving, as always, each week we're talking about it. (laughs) You know, last week we talked to Randall and Ida Cobb and their wonderful relationship and how they're thriving in that. But thriving in this conversation today is particularly about how you can turn your weakness into strengths and how you can stop underestimating yourself and start being the best version you can be just the way that you are. So enjoy our conversation with Dr. Tracy Alloway. She's incredible. Her book is out now. I think it's fantastic. I think it helps every single person, male or female. We talk about that too. You know, how can males get, you know, the most out of the information and the research that she's done? So check it out. Leave any reviews, ratings, all of that does help. And make sure you have subscribed. Without further ado, here's our conversation with Dr. Tracy Alloway. Well, thank you, Dr. Alloway, for joining me today. I'm very grateful to learn more about what you have done and what you've created with Think Like a Girl, your new book. And, you know, the first thing I want to ask you is, you know, as an award-winning psychologist, who did you want to be when you were a little girl? (laughs) That's a great question, Taylor. I haven't been asked that. You know, when I was little, I always wanted to be a psychologist. So in a sense, I feel like I'm living my dream and I feel very fortunate. (laughs) So how did you, how did you know what a psychologist was when you were a little girl? Yes, yeah, so we had uh, different people from different occupations come and talk to us about their day. And the psychologist came in and started talking about what they did. And I was just, I was mesmerized that, you know, you could have such an impact on someone's life this way. And it just, it got me hooked from the very beginning. <laughs> That's so neat. You always wonder like what career days kind of stick with people. And it's interesting to see right. that it did stick with you. Absolutely. Okay. With your new book, Everything that you are talking about is something that I mentioned to you a little bit earlier, but it's think like a girl is analyzing the woman's brain and how we often kind of look at it as a disadvantage. Some of these different traits thinking, oh, emotional or, you know, we overthink things. And what your book does is it kind of breaks it down and it lets us see the advantages. How did you decide that that was something you wanted to study? I think really it was when, you know, I'm a researcher, a scientist, and I'm reading the scientific articles and I'm seeing that the findings are always with, not always, but typically a broad brushstroke. Oh, we all act this way. We all think this way. And as I began to peel back some of the layers and even look at my own research coming out of my lab, I saw that there were these nuances. Well, sometimes men act differently, sometimes women act differently. And then it made me reflect, well, are these some of these differences or patterns because of our neurochemistry, or are they just, you know, cultural things that we hear? And ultimately, how can we live a a life that leans into the strengths, the unique aspects of how our brains are working? Mm -hmm. And what were some of the more interesting things that you found immediately, like the top (laughs) of, you know, the low hanging fruit that was just so apparent of the differences in a good way? Yeah, so for me, it was this idea that um, women are emotional when we make decisions. That was one of the myths that I wanted to address. And I actually look at that right up front in the book, because it's exactly like you said, it was something 
that you know I hear all the time too, and I hear my, my girlfriends tell me that they hear the same thing. But in my lab, I found that, um, so I asked people to do what's called the trolley dilemma, which is now very popular. It's in some popular TV shows. The idea is simple. You see a train hurling towards you and you can save the day and save these five people that are gonna get injured, but it means injuring or harming one other person. And oftentimes women are accused of being emotional in that kind of setup, that they, they're not, you know, they can't kind of think with the rational brain and so on. And what I found was really interesting was that um, researchers found that women respond that way because they want to protect. They don't want to cause harm. So this idea of appearing emotional or weak when we're making decisions under stress like that are really because it's coming from a fantastic place. We want to protect the people around us. We, we don't want to cause harm. So that was the first kind of interesting tidbit that I learned. The second was, this is coming from my own lab where I saw that we can actually flip the switch. So we have two pathways when we make decisions. One is a hot or emotional decision coming from your amygdala, your brain's emotional center. And the second is your rational or cold decision-making coming from your prefrontal cortex. And I found that when you stick your hand in a bucket of ice, it induces a stress response. So your emotional brain is so busy kind of managing that stress, fight or flight, what should we do, that it frees up your rational brain to weigh pros and cons and think, well, what should I do here? What may be best for me? And so a great takeaway is, let's say, you know, you're offered a job in another city and your first thought is, well, I don't want to let my boss down. What about my team? We've been working together and so on. And it may be really hard to look past those really positive emotions. You know, you want to protect, you don't want to cause harm. And sticking your hand in a bucket of ice just for one minute is enough to flip the switch and kind of move that decision-making to the front of your brain. Wow, that's such a great tangible tip. Do you have any others like that for decision making? Because I do think that's that's something I get asked quite often. It's like, how do you do this? And, you know, I think that decisions are difficult, but then add the emotional response to it that we have innately. Do you have yeah. any other tangible tips similar to the hand in the ice water? <laughs> Yeah, so this actually refers to mental health. And again, it's something that we hear, especially with maybe Mental Health Awareness Month, um, this idea that, well, women are more experienced, more depression or anxiety or mental health concerns compared to men. So I really wanted to explore whether this was true. And I found that in part, our neurochemistry is wired in such a way that it makes us more attentive to situations that do cause uh, stress, anxiety, and so on. Now, what I think is exciting is that it's not deterministic. Just because our brain chemistry is this way, it doesn't mean that we're stuck on this path and we have to stick with it. And so a simple tip is to change one word. Instead of saying, yes, but, so, you know, I had an interview, but, but I didn't get to do this, or say this and meet so-and-so, change the but to an and. Yes, and I got to showcase some of my skills. I got to meet new people. I got to network. And what that does in the brain is it switches our perspective to one of gratitude, one of optimism. And there's a real power to language because we know from brain imaging studies that the left side of the brain, our Broca's area, our language center, is our optimism center. So the more we practice, like a muscle, the more we practice saying, yes, and, yes, and, it kind of strengthens that optimism side of the brain. And brain imaging studies actually show that over time, we see more activation right away compared to, you know, brain regions associated with a pessimistic outlook. Wow, that's so interesting, especially as gratitude has become such a forefront, kind of almost a buzzword in 2020 mm -hmm. and 21 after everything that we've experienced. Now you're finding scientific proof that gratitude and optimism can truly have long-term benefits for your life. Yeah, and not only that, so there was another study that I did for my lab where we had close to 4,000 people, men, women, all different ages, all across the lifespan. And I was looking at precursors for experiencing depression, depressive symptoms. So things like, I feel like I can't get out of bed. Nothing brings me joy anymore. You know, those kinds of feelings that we all sometimes have but when it becomes so acute and so serious. And I wanted to know what happens before that? What can we kind of stop? What's that gatekeeper there? And I found it was actually optimism. Whatever your age, whether you're male or female, if you have an optimistic outlook, you are creating a buffer, a bubble for your brain that prevents you from experiencing depressive symptoms. Wow. How would you define optimism? Yeah, that's a great question. So optimism tends to be, 
I think good things are going to happen in life. I believe the best when I put my effort forward. So, you know, we do hear a lot of kind of blind optimism where, you, you, you know, you're like, ah, it's all going to work out. And this is different. It's actually the sense that when I put effort in, I know my effort's going to pay off. I know that, you know, when I'm working hard, something good is going to come out of it. And it's almost like reframing. How do you see that situation? So again, back to the job interview example, instead of thinking, I never get these jobs. I've been in interviews for weeks now and I'm just not landing any of them. It, if you reframe and think, well, every time I do an interview, I learn something and I'm practicing it mm. in the next interview. Something good is going to happen. That kind of hopefulness is a great way to think of optimism. Wow. I, I That's so interesting to hear that. And, you know, kind of going back to the book and the different tangible evidence and the different ways that we're now seeing the strengths of our own brain. What were the three top traits that you'd say women naturally have just when we're born, our natural instincts? Yeah. So one of them, I was looking at this idea of empathy, you know, mm. when you feel connected to someone, which is a little different from sympathy. It's where you actually can emotionally feel their pain a little bit. And I did find interestingly, and this was a surprise to me too, that they've done twin studies and looking at, again, the neurochemistry. And it's not something so much that we're born with, but that our culture cultivates it. So as young girls, we're, we're encouraged to be empathetic. We're encouraged to share and to play together and to think about other, other people's feelings more so than perhaps a young boy. And so part of this is it kind of, you know, the, the more you watch to something, the more it's going to grow. And I certainly saw that in the case of empathy. Another interesting thing is when it comes to lying. Um, and so, like, you know, do you tell a lie? And my own research has shown that, first of all, telling a lie is a sign of intelligence. So not necessarily a bad thing, um, but women tell different types of lies than men. So I look at the difference between uh, an antisocial lie to protect yourself. So imagine a young kid, mom comes in, did you eat the cookies I left out? Crumbs all over their face. No, no, I didn't. You know, lying to protect themselves. They don't want to get in trouble. And compared with a pro-social lie, did you see your brother or sister eat the cookie? No, I didn't because they want to now protect someone else. And um, we see from uh, research with adults that women are more likely to lie to protect someone else than they would for themselves. Mm. And I was, I wanted to see it, you know, how far back can yeah. we go with it? So I looked at four-year-olds. We played a really simple game, just grab some paper balls, throw them in a basket. And we, you know, we turn around. So we pretend we're not looking yeah, and like, so on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there's a, you know, a little a camera set up. And so of course we, we incentivize them to kind of cheat a little because we say there's lots of prizes if you make eight out of 10 baskets and we set them up to fail. So they're not going to make these baskets. So we want them to cross the line, pick it up, put it in the basket and so on. And then we have another researcher do the same thing, but she's cheating, you know, she's picking up the ball, she's just popping them in the basket right away. And we ask the kids, did you cheat? And then we say, did, the, did this other lady cheat too? And so we see that even at four years old, the young girls would lie more to protect someone else than they would for themselves. I'm curious, do you think that stems from fear too, in the sense they're afraid of getting in trouble? Because I, I feel like just speaking as a woman, so what you're talking about is so true, the protection, but also the fear of, um, you know, reprimanding or anything that could get you in trouble or quote unquote, set you back. That's a great question. And so one of the things we were looking at is how these young boys and girls viewed their peer relationships as maybe an indicator, you know, how connected they felt. And we did see that for the young girls, the more they valued their peer approval, so mm -hmm. kind of connected maybe to this whole idea, the more they valued their, their peers' approval, their friends' approval, the more likely they were to lie to protect someone else. So wow. again, this kind of social structure seems to set us up as women for acting a certain way. How do you balance kind of the social structure that you live in and just what would be best for you to succeed or quote unquote thrive in life? Yeah, that's a great question. And I look at that in my chapters on leadership. So I look at there's two different leadership styles. Really, the myth or question that I was looking at is do women have to be more masculine to be a good leader or to be perceived as a good leader? And by masculine, researchers define this as you know, typically a little bit more aggressive. You're always right. You are the one that's setting the tone for the group and so on. And so this is how the research is defining these traits. And actually what comes out is that 
male um, colleagues will perceive a woman who acts in that way as weaker rather than, you know, if they're acting as authentic to themselves as a leader. And so wow. I was looking at different leadership styles and actually found that when women uh, take on a leadership role that is not authentic to themselves, they report feeling higher levels of stress and burnout compared to, you know, hey, this is the way I want to lead. And, I, you know, I think what was interesting for me in that chapter is that leadership, it's not a fixed uh, trait. You know, sometimes we have to be a leader that's project focused, deadline focused. Other times we're a leader that's collaborative. We want to get all ideas on deck and so on. And for someone who's able to figure out, hey, what's, you know, what's important for which situation, that's the most authentic uh, self. That's so unique. I've never heard it phrased that way because I, I think that's correct. A lot of times in the workplace, you feel like you have to show quote unquote a dominance, but really just being yourself will be more respectful and adaptable to the environment. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So now how can men learn from your findings in your book too? <laughs> that's a great question you know I have a father and brother and friends and so on I think first it's two part I think it's always important to have that awareness about how our brain is working so that we can relate to each other a little bit better so that we don't just immediately assume oh well you know she's just emotional because she's a woman or she's just overreacting and so we can really come from a place of awareness and understanding um, and second of all in the book I do talk a little bit about how the male and female brain works with intelligence and lying, with creativity. I talk about humor and comedy and how the brain works differently for men and women in that respect. Um, also for risk-taking. So actually all the chapters offer a little insight to the male brain as well. How is How has your research impacted your own life? That's a great question. I would say the biggest impact was in the happiness chapter where, you know, when you go through this period of low, you really have to think, I'm writing this research, how strongly do I believe it? And really just putting some of these things in practice and where, you know, when, when I had those moments of thinking, yes, but no, yes, and, and, and sometimes the and is simple. Yes, and it's a new day or yes, and, you know, really as, as simple as that, nothing fantastic, you know, and really just being able to put that in practice. I saw a change in my mindset over time as well. Yeah. You know, I like what you're pointing out there too, because sometimes I've noticed, I've heard the and statements where, you know, just kind of creating more conversation and realizing what your life is really entailing, but it doesn't always have to be grand. Like you said, it could be those little small moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I, I like to start my morning with gratitude. Some people prefer ending their day with gratitude, but at some points in my life, it was as simple as I'm glad I'm walking outside this morning, or oh, I'm glad the sun looks so beautiful, you know, really trying to be intentional. And again, these are small everyday things that we can all focus on. Like, so, and it, it does definitely make a difference. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful to have you on and share this conversation with you. And my last question, I ask everyone, when do you personally feel like you are thriving in life? That is such a great question, Taylor. Wow. Um, I feel like I'm personally thri thriving when I'm finding joy in the present moment, when I'm in a situation and maybe I could just be sitting and reading, or maybe I could be engaging in a great conversation or um, going for a run. But when that moment is bringing me joy because it shows that I'm connected to the present, I'm not anxious about what's ahead. I'm not worried about what has happened. I'm really engaged in the present. Well, and I'm, I'm so interested to hear your response for that, because since you've studied this and you've looked at this, I will tell you, most answers have been around being present and being connected to the moment from a neuro look at it. Why, yeah. why is that? So it seems so simple because it's right here, right now. Why do we struggle <laughs> with that so often? Yeah. And that goes back to what I talk about in the happiness chapter. One of the pieces of research I was looking at again is what happens specifically in the female brain and what can we do as women to stop falling into this, this kind of depression hole. And really for women, it's rumination. This idea that things keep playing on her loop. Like, Oh, man, this, and I should have, and, I, and it just, it's hard to stop. And of course, you know, I'm a licensed psychologist and there's lots of different therapies of how to stop that. But really one of a really effective one is first of all, acknowledge the emotion. Just, and I tell my clients the same, and I try to practice this the same. I take maybe five minutes, maybe sometimes it's 10 minutes where I'm like, 
I'm angry or I'm frustrated. And I just allow myself to feel that emotion. But once that timer goes, that's it. I cannot open that door back again and be like, yeah, but if only, oh, shit, you know, there's none of that. Like the door is shut. I've had my five minutes or maybe, you know, and I'll tell my clients, if you need another minute, take that minute, but it can't just let, you know, you can't let your mind just ruminate and kind of focus on that. And then I have to say three positive things. It's kind of this, again, research has shown a three to one ratio of positive to negative. So for every, you know, when I'm thinking of this negative emotion or this negative situation, instead of allowing myself to get in the loop, I allow myself to feel that emotion, I label it, I acknowledge it, and then I have to have three positive things and move on. And that, you know, that really stops this ruminative cycle that we may be more as women because of our neurochemistry more susceptible to. Oh, thank you so much, doctor. This has been so fascinating. And you have just given so many nuggets that I know there are plenty more in the book. And thank you for writing it, because I think you're doing a great service to women, men, all of us, especially as we're dealing with the wild of life. (laughs) I really appreciate you, Taylor. Thanks so much for having me on. If you're loving the show, and I hope you are, I would love to hear from you. Head on over to your podcast app, scroll down to where it says ratings and reviews, and I'd love to hear your thoughts with a rating and review. Your words might just be what the next person needs to tune in and turn their purpose into passion. Thanks for listening.